Hi, everybody. It's Rob Shapiro from In the Mind Of. Today, we're excited to have Will Mortensen here with us to go over the idea of McKenzie and McKenzie Extremity, understand a little different concept that we, that we use every day. So happy to have Will with us. Good to be here. Good. It's fun. We did this a little bit for McKenzie for spine. And then kind of interesting part, because McKenzie for extremities is one of those things that people go, hmm, I, I understand the spine but I'm not sure about the extremities. So, Will, take us away. What What is the method? I mean, a lot of people have heard of it, you know, and then if you're kind of older, you start thinking you never really, you think it's an extension program or what is the method itself? Yeah, so I totally get that. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's definitely got a, uh, it's, extension is definitely the, reputation that it has um but it's it's really a school of treating based on symptom response which isn't necessarily unique to mckenzie but uh because i know that's a component of something like maitland as well but you are diagnosing and treating based not on pathoanatomy but on symptomatic response and there are a few different hallmarks of the McKenzie method that are true, not just when working uh, with patients with neck or back pain, but uh, these hallmarks can be taken uh, when working with patients with shoulder pain, knee pain, ankle pain. These are principles that can be applied all across the board. So we have some uh, bullet points uh, listing those hallmarks that can be applied for uh, not just the spine, but the extremities as well. Okay. What was your experience with extremities? Because when I first started, I mean, I think they theoretically they mentioned that they had the extremities and it wasn't wasn't a big part of the system. What's your yeah. feeling? It's, it's definitely a growing part of the field. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a younger component of the McKenzie method in general. And I think... Uh, there does need to be more research done on, uh, you know, the efficacy of the the management of these classifications as they relate to the extremities. However, I think that actually makes it kind of more exciting as a clinician and gives us a lot more freedom to kind of do these cause and effect experiments with patients who are coming in with, uh, you know, referring diagnoses of rotator cuff tears, uh, knee osteoarthritis, and really gives us freedom to, to kind of be creative and apply these principles, um, uh, which just makes it really exciting and uh, allows for a lot of um, critical thinking from day to day, which is great. So the goal, what, what Will and I are going to do tonight, we're, we haven't, something kind of planned, but it's not, again, we're so open, kind of he and I probably have so much fun just kind of discussing it. We probably should have just recorded our discussion, right, for the last couple of days as we go through it. So if you guys have questions, it's a, it might be different for you, kind of a weird, you know, how do you think of McKenzie as a derangement for a knee? You know, when I first remember hearing that stuff, I'm like, a derangement, is it, is it, some, is it a meniscus? Is it, you know, in the shoulder, is it a labrum? But we'll discuss more of that as we go through it. So, Will, is it, how about classifications wise? Do they, what's similar, what's different from the spine versus the extremities? Yeah. So, the, the, you're, you're looking at the same classifications for the extremities uh, as with the spine. Uh, there are some differences in terms of prevalence. Um, so, with the spine, both for the neck and the lumbar regions, um, you see a, a vast majority of derangements. These are patients who are coming in with uh, whether they have radiating pain or radiating symptoms referring from the spine, they're going to uh, report variable symptoms. They're going to uh, demonstrate some kind of directional preference, um, and they're going to tend to respond rapidly to uh, whatever their directional preference is that you lean into, uh, especially at end range. I think soon we'll have to, do, we'll get to that in a few minutes. We'll actually define those because it's sometimes, you know, it's funny when we do it, we're like, those are words we always, we automatically use. Yeah. So arrangement is one part. Anyway, so we have a uh, dysfunction, right? What about, is this function the same in spine and extremity? What, how would you differentiate those? 
And we'll just, again, we'll define everything later more, but. Sure, for sure. The extremities are really where we start to introduce the idea of a contractile dysfunction and actually begin to distinguish between articular and contractile dysfunctions. Um, whereas in the spine, that distinction isn't as clearly made, um, partly because it's, it's so challenging to distinguish between an articular and contractile dysfunction in the spine. Um, so that becomes uh, an, a really interesting component to investigate when somebody's coming in with a generic shoulder pain or a generic uh, hip pain. Right. And then posture, you don't really see. We talk about posture, we talk about it. It's really is it actually the primary, only posture. You know, there, it, it fits in others and other is like how many other it's like 15 other things that go into other so that's kind of interesting and for this for this discussion we're not going to really talk about the other but well we have to know that it's there so if you're a group out there you don't have to we didn't do a poll but i want you to think about if you know if will and i said uh, what category do you think a patient with knee oa would typically fit and we'll in a few minutes we'll go through the different um the different uh, categories so you got derangement, and we'll, we'll define it in a second. But as we go through this talk, think in your head where would it fit. And you might not know the definition yet of each. Would it be a derangement, a dysfunction, dysfunction either contractile or articular? Would it be posture or other? So think of it. As we go through it, we'll try to build a story and kind of see if we all come up with a similar part. Seems pretty obvious, but it might not be. We'll see. So how do we describe? What is it? You know, what would you say? You talked about before talk about the word directional preference in the extremities compared to the idea of a, a spine. So kind yeah. of repeat, go to that idea of it. Yeah, well, and I, I think we were talking yesterday, Rob, about um, really distinguishing between a directional preference and the idea of a direction that's comfortable, you know, because I think even as clinicians, sometimes we don't necessarily delve into, okay, is this is this a direction that somebody is just reporting that they tend to be comfortable with? Or is this a, is this a direction that if we lean into enough, their symptoms will actually reduce and abolish and remain better uh, with, with some kind of maintenance program? So a directional preference can either be a centralization or, well, in, if we're talking about the spine, it's that centralization um, of symptoms or the direction that when leaned into enough results in some kind of mechanical improvement. So that would be like uh, range of motion improving. So that is, that is characteristic of a derangement and luckily in the spine at least um, is the most prevalent of the classifications. In the extremities, it's a little bit more um, it's a little bit, it's not quite as prevalent. You have a lot more others uh, in the extremities, but the the classification and, and the criteria that a patient needs uh, to be classified as a derangement is kind of, it's the same as with the spine. So let's kind of make it even, it was good, more, more clear, like thinking derangement is a big topic. So within derangement, for spine, there's centralization, right? There's a phenomenon of centralization. We know that, you know, in the spine, a distal symptom with repeated motion will centralize. Do, do we have that in the extremities? Do we call it centralization? Right. So with the extremities, because you don't necessarily have that referring pain, what you tend to see for the, you know, using the hip as an example, you're going to see uh, much more characteristically a global pain that localizes uh, versus the sciatic type pain that you might find with the, the lumbar spine. Right. And so it's interesting before I started looking at more um, extremities, McKinsey, like, you know, I would think, oh, somebody had hip pain, they do repeated, it doesn't centralize, so it must not be a derangement. But it could be, you could actually have a, even for a low back derangement, right? We could still have. Um, if the disc itself without having a nerve, we could actually get that pain to just get decreased in range and improve range of motion and decrease of their symptoms is key. So anytime you do something, repeat something, don't just look for centralization, but look at the idea that 
as you do something, the pain gets less, the function gets more. And those are important things. In extremities, you're like, oh, you're looking for something to centralize, it won't happen. And why do we think, you know, it's, we say we don't know, what do, what do you think theories are? Do you have a, like, what is it? What is a derangement, quote unquote, in the extremities? We think it's something meniscus stuck. This, you know, years ago, before I even looked into it more, I'm like, oh. Yeah, the, the operation, yeah. yeah, that's that's a good question, Rob, because the operational def definition of derangement is, it, it's kind of the same for extremities as it is for the spine in, in that it's some kind of obstruction, uh, you know, whether that's soft tissue obstruction or intra-articular. Um, so, so for the knee, that could hypothetically be a meniscal issue. Um, uh, it could be labral for the hip. Um, you know, and, and I've, I've, you know, it, it almost, I, I hesitate to say that it doesn't matter. Um, because, mm -hmm. you know, if, if that tissue really is influencing symptoms, then you 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 may have a derangement you ha may have an other um that um uh, you know and and of course some patients do require uh that you know surgical intervention or otherwise uh to clean up the joint and and but we we distinguish that um by going through this system of assessment and doing our repeated movements to see uh you know who's really just got a, a directional preference that we need to do repeated movements to to discover. Mm -hmm. right. I think of it, you know, a lot of times you talk about that type of tissue, but I almost think of it, you know, my favorite word lately has become centration, the ability of the joint to be centrated in the middle. And I, I think sometimes with these, what my understanding of these derangements is it might be that the joint is just kind of positioned abnormally with that, you know, not centered in there. It might be pinching some tissue. It might not be a meniscus, could be a capsule, yeah. but it's something that might be. A, so that's why I think it works more. I think if you truly had, quote unquote, what we think of the arrangement of a, you know, a meniscus, or that's a, that's kind of more, not ours type of person. Because unless we try to load it, if there's no effect, but the people that we can affect more, almost go back. They're almost talking about it more these days is like, a, like Mulligan would talk about, right? The idea of getting that joint in its best position so it can function. I always give the story. It's like, uh, you know, he got done his partying in, uh, at his house and people kind of walk into his back door and it's a slider and it comes off the slider. And it's, you know, it's yeah. as he closes it, it gets, it's off, off kilter. Someone else comes along as Stephanie comes along his wife and puts it in the right spot. And now it can repeatedly, she gets it to work well. And that's, I think what happens in the joints, you know, and a, a good example. I mean, if you have one, I'll think of one, like, you know, I go, I do my, I bring my arm above my head. Oh, that hurts. 135, 140. The joint may be, theoretically, might be not centrated, might be more anterior. I do repeated, you know, from a McKenzie method, you might just do repeated maybe shoulder extension because you're stretching out that tissue, getting that joint in a better position. If you're a manual therapy guy, you might do your mobs and then see, and all of a sudden you retest what you did and it's better range. Right. Those are, you know, quick, the cool part, those are the quick responders. That's yeah, the cool part. It, it would always be interesting to, to really do some kind of imaging to show cause and effect there to see if you're really making a change on the joint itself. Because from a, you know, I, I'm, I'm always trying to learn more about the pain science. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think you could also make an argument for, you know, what are we triggered by? What are we doing too much of? And and I think, you know, in the McKenzie spine world, you know, the the analogy would be too much too much flexion, right? So we 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 spend so much time in flexion during our day, whether that's bending, uh, you know, doing groceries, sitting, uh, you know, prolonged static flexion uh, in sitting, driving. So the the argument there is, uh, our triggers are result are a result of what we're just simply doing too much of during our day. It's it's always kind of this idea of it's the the straw that breaks the camel's back. And I think so much of our directional preferences come from going into an opposing direction of our triggers. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, 
not even thinking about pathoanatomically what what the explanation might be there because the truth is the more we the more we study you know uh and you know per perform imaging studies on asymptomatic individuals so there's such a huge population out there that has these you know <laughs> su supposedly uh these things like disc degeneration, rotator cuff uh, tears, without being symptomatic at all. Um, so, you know, I think I think it's kind of intuitive to to want to find some pathoanatomical explanation for, you know, why moving in certain directions reduces pain, and you know, I think from a pain science perspective. Sometimes it can just be as simple as moving in the direction opposite of our triggers. You know, what what are we doing too much of during our day? And that's kind of how I st started to talk about it with my patients. Right. That's one of the common things, you know, they get into McKinsey. They talk about, well, you know, where do I start? And it's truly really what aggravates your, your pain. Right. Go the other right. way and see the response of it. So one of the questions on the, on the hotline from, from George is, how does flexibility of the stabilizing muscles affect the derangement? And the answer to it is, if you were a McKenzie person, uh, I talk as as me educators had to be in the the McKenzie, you know, quote unquote direct McKenzie, they would say by repeatedly doing the right motion in the right direction, that would centrate that joint and you would that's it, that would be it for that system. Mine would be, you know, we have a thought process as we go and I talk about the pyramid, you centrate that joint and then you have to get you have to get the control, the motor control after. And that's the muscles around it you know, part of it. So the repeated motion will help the length of the muscle and we have to do exercises specific. The true McKenzie and see if, if I'm wrong, well, but the true McKenzie people say by just sense by getting that joint to move, you'll be fine, which again, there's a many different theories and that's the McKenzie philosophy of it. If it's right. Yeah. And I, I would make the argument that, you know, not just in physical therapy, but in medicine in general for, for, as long as it's been practiced, we've had a little bit of a post hoc reasoning when it comes to our treatments, right? Um, so we 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 treat initially, oftentimes based on correlation, rather than finding out the causation first and then understanding what's what's really the culprit here. So I think sometimes in the case of uh, we can talk about low back pain and then and then knee pain because in low back pain, uh, you know, for a long time it was like, oh, you have back pain because your TRA isn't isn't activating and you have poor core stability, um, you know, and and your transverse abdominis is not pulling its weight, um, and then we have all of these um, maybe EMG studies showing that you know folks with low back pain have. Uh, lower levels of TRA activation and and uh, and motor control, but is that it, it gets a little chicken egg because we is is the TRA weakness contributing and and causal for the back pain, or is your pain inhibiting that musculature from doing its job appropriately? Muscles don't like to work through pain. Uh, we know this, right? So, uh, and for the knee, um, for a long time, it's, uh, you know, oh, we got to get that VMO active, right? Your VMO is weak. But when we're testing somebody's knee extension at eval, um, is their knee weakness, you know, when we're assessing it, is that causal? And I think for a long time, we kind of jump, jump to that conclusion. And that's certainly how I'm taught, or that's how I was taught in grad school. You know, uh, you manual muscle test somebody's quads, and if they're weak, oh, uh, you've got knee pain because of your quad weakness. If we just strengthen your knee, um, your pain's going to go down. But is that quad, you know, that quad can be weak because of the pain. So it's it's interesting to really think about. So from a McKenzie perspective, if that's why sometimes people's strength magically appears to improve uh when you expose that directional preference and you if you just if you just lean into their alleviating direction 
and then you see their strength improve, was the weakness really the cause of their pain? You know, it's just an, it's been a really interesting journey of, of just kind of delving into that a little bit, you know? Right. And, and some of my thoughts, and then probably not all oh, McKenzie, but you have to get that sensation before you start your motor control, then you strengthen, you work up the pyramid as it goes. And I think with, you know, back with George's question, interesting part where the, the McKenzie group would probably, it's all different wording. Like, for example, if I can't go above my head and I repeat an extension, they might say I'm centrating a joint. George might say, hey, I'm looking at the soft tissue component, letting that head of the humerus. They don't talk pathological, so they're just saying, what is that movement doing? And then we can sit back and decide, hey, what's going on? Look at it specifically. So what do people uh, report in their history, typically with a derangement? What are you? What kind of things will let you kind of go through your kind of talk about it? How, do, how What would make you say, "Hey, I think this this extremity issue is a derange might be a derangement." What characteristics do you look at in the history? Yeah. So these these first two bullet points are going to be much more specific to how the extremity derangements when you're sitting down with somebody at initial evaluation, how they're actually going to report um, wh what a joint derangement might actually sound like versus a spine derangement. So um, if somebody's coming in and describing their symptoms to you and you're trying to distinguish if this is really referring from the spine or if this is truly an extremity issue, um, a joint derangement is going to sound a lot more specific. Uh, the, the patient's going to come in really knowing what makes them feel better or worse. So that's going to be indicating to you that maybe this it has a little bit more likelihood that it's not a spinal issue. Um, again, like Rob and I talked about, joint pains are uh, going to be more of a global pain versus radiating. With both spine and extremity derangements, pain tends to linger once produced. Um, pain at rest, constant pain, is characteristic of either a derangement or of an other classification. Um, like mm -hmm. or Yeah, yeah. Um, derangements always have movement loss in some kind of direction. Um, and this is more of just uh, a practical uh, bullet, but when you have a more proximal joint, whether that's the hip or the shoulder, the more suspicious we should all be that it's referring from the spine um, versus, you know, if somebody's coming in and they're reporting only ankle pain with no history of back pain, uh, we can be a little bit more expedient with clearing the spine. Um, and then, of course, variability of symptoms. Some days are better than others is going to be um, a real alarm bell that this is probably a derangement. Uh, that's one of those, no, that's right, one of those hallmark things of a derangement, right? Better or worse, uh, even spine and extremity. Some days good, some days bad. Where we'll talk about dysfunction is pretty, you know, pretty, consist pretty consistent. When I hit this range, oh, it hurts. It's consistent pattern. Where well, these arrangements are kind of weird, like, you know, where are they coming from? That type of thing. For sure. And then the key part of it, understanding a derangement. So if you went through, through that rapidly, we'll go through this in a second. But um, what would be some of your thought process as you go through your, what does an object, objective exam look like compared to what makes this system, in my mind, different than the typical either Maitland system, the Norwegian system, or typical ortho? You know, what do you find the hallmarks as far as repeated, repeating motion, right? That's the... Yeah, repeated motion, really emphasis, because you're right, Rob, with, with, with other schools like Maitland, uh, finding that, finding that, like, I think Maitland would call it a comparable sign. Um, yes. yeah. so that isn't necessarily unique to McKenzie. I think what's unique is that not just the repeated movements, yes, as a, as, as a really important, important part of the assessment, uh, also the, the, the built-in, uh, progression of forces so that you have a methodical plan uh, and understanding what 
the response to those forces means for your assessment and what direction to go from there. Um, and then also the progression of forces, repeated movements, and the independence that you're placing on the patient coming in with you. There's, there's really, there are really few examples where you start with a hands-on approach in an, in a McKenzie assessment, you have to have pretty clear indicators that someone is going to require a hands-on approach right out of the gate, uh, in a, in a McKenzie evaluation, um, there's a lot of placement in empowering the patient to treat their own symptoms. And only when that plateaus or fails, do we, uh, approach it from a manual perspective. So I think that's, a, that's another kind of unique component of the McKenzie system. It definitely is. It's interesting because that side, I mean, again, what I've learned over the years, if you were true anything, a true McKenzie, a true this or true that. But the key for me, if I get out of this concept, is patient management type of thing is, is perfect. I think it's important. But I think that whole idea of, you know, typically, let me just check how your knee moves. Let me extend it, flex it, rotate of your hip, the, and then be done. We'll repeat it, you know, repeated motion. And specifically, if it's going to be this, it's going to help you differentiate a derangement versus dysfunction. Because if somebody, you do repeated motion, it is interesting to see if I repeat. You know, I just go back to the shoulder because it helps my shoulder. So I repeat extension. It's amazing how you can get that, make a difference. And they would yeah, call that yeah. a derangement. I, Same thing I, with the hip. Right, right. And and I think maybe not entirely unique to the McKenzie method, but one of one of the best things that I can do or or that we can do as clinicians, especially when it comes to encouraging adherence for patients uh, to, to continue to really sell them on their, what we're prescribing to them for exercise. Uh, I think the greatest tool we have for that is cause and effect. If we can show cause and effect, which it, again, isn't necessarily unique to McKenzie, but the, the patient showing themselves cause and effect, I think is pretty unique to McKenzie um, because we always start there. And if somebody is going to uh, perform a repeated movement on themselves, uh, you, you, you test their strength prior to, or you, you assess their range of motion and the pain that they have through it, uh, prior to a repeated movement. And then they have, you have them perform 10, 20 repetitions of something, and then they feel better. You don't need to tell them anything. They, they know what just happened. So it's really exciting when you, when you are going through your examination and you find that reducing movement, uh, the movement that results in that directional preference, if they are a derangement, uh, and they, they, it's like a light goes off for them and they see like, oh, you, like not only can my pain be changed, but I, I might actually not need to be dependent on somebody else to affect it. It's, right. it's pretty awesome. So to me, so from, uh. So George's question, how does the McKenzie um, method look at kinetic chain, so like repetitive movement at the knee, but the issue is a motor control issue? Like how does they, how they differentiate or do they hmm. as a McKenzie system? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I would say the system distinguishes between if it's a true motor control issue versus if the pain is influencing the motor control, right? It's that, it's that whole chicken egg situation, right? Is that motor, is that poor motor control a result of the triggers that the person is repeating during the day that they might not even be aware of? Right. My thinking is we'll probably look at that, you know, if there is, you know, repeated, let's say they have pain with extension, we go the opposite, we do repeated flexion, extension gets better. From that part, the McKenzie people might say, we did what we need to do, right? From us, we might say, well, we got that in a better position. Now we have to go up the chain to stay positive. I'm not sure as a system what they, you know, if they would specifically look at that as much. It's just a different 
whole different way. They, they'll do some Therex, but they're not a big Therex type of group per se. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I think you, there's room for both, you know, there's room for both approaches. I think once you establish, I mean, uh, if somebody is coming in, uh, at, even if they are a derangement and their pain improves and they restore full range of motion, they may still have goals of improved core strength for this, you know, for whatever recreational activity they want to perform. You can still work with them on improving their, their long-term functional goals that, you know, even though we've addressed their, uh, mechanical and pain impairments through whatever repeated movements, uh, again, if they are a derangement, uh, it doesn't need to be the end of their episode of care, uh, because they have, they maybe have other the up goals that have to do with pure strength and optimizing, uh, their, their sports performance, uh, that McKenzie, um, you know, doesn't necessarily delve into. Yeah. And I agree. I think that's, it's also with this system would be to be like any system, it's how do I prioritize? So if you found somebody truly with a derangement type of presentation, the priority is to set, we don't have centralization here, but is to localize, get normal movement back. So what we would, I would think I would take it again up. I always go back to the pyramid. Do you have to get that good mobility? If you don't have that good mobility. You can't get motor control. You can't get strength. Right. So I think we, the cool part, what, I, what we've done and, you know, we try to do through Cody Collections is combining different systems and, you know, if the best of each system. To me, initially, the best of each system was a McKenzie system was the spine centralization idea. And then finding pretty cool stuff, you know, surprisingly derangement stuff with extremity. And as you said, with the McKenzie group itself, when I taking a course and, you, you know, you tell me your thoughts on it, it was spine they're spot on they you know they have it all down they've done this before extremities is kind of well we think and we're trying to keep making it you know they have it you know they from experience and probably a little bit more case study based if you're trying to find articles on it where if you go to the other side truly centralization it's like you know Dallas and Smith this you know all these studies that show it work right. so I think it's a work you know it's like a it's to me it's a great what you know I always tease them the this being out um you know, starting out as a Maitland guy, McKenzie is Maitland gone wild. It's basically thinking it's all clinical reasoning. And then they kind of yeah, went yeah. off on the other side of it. But well, so what about, yeah, that's why, that's why it's fun as a system though, because you can, you apply the same methodology and principles and you, you just, you go and explore, you say like, all right, uh, you know, in, in your assessment, you, you just go methodically through and, and if you can just classify you know, if I if I was watching this presentation, I would one of my big takeaways from this presentation would be just just rule out the derangements, right? If you can just determine if somebody has a directional preference or not, uh, and then experiment with that based on what your findings are with that patient, then then you've done you've done so much, and you've probably saved yourself a lot of time too. And and like the worst thing that happens is you try something that this this patient probably hasn't tried before All right so the typical i mean to give some we'll, we'll go through some more stuff shortly like honestly for shoulder the typical directional preferences are extension and intro could be intro rotation extension and horizontal ad for hip typically extension intro rotation so you start thinking you know if you're a muscle guy you say well it's hip flexor you know it doesn't matter if you think of it it's just the idea they don't they don't go by pathoanatomy so they're not saying oh it's a iliopsoas or iliacus it's tight or they're just saying that, yeah, whatever it is, by repeated motion, I'm centrating that hip more. You know, as if you're a muscle guy, you'll say, yeah, you know, I do Thomas test all the time, or I do a modified Thomas test, or I do. And, and it, what you would do is what you already do, just put repeated motion on it, but then go back. So, for example, if my patient can't, and if this, uh, your thoughts on this, so if my patient can't do hip flexion, I should say, well, maybe it's a, arthritic hip, a beginning, you know, flexion, internal rotation, maybe it's a capsular pattern, starting of something. Then I might say, well, let me just repeat it extension. Then I go back to my initial test and it gets better. Then I know that there's something, there's some type of directional preference, right? Because I'm able to put that 
head of the femur in a more centrated position quickly. If it was truly a capsular problem, we get into it would be more a dysfunction, right? Because you know, if, if I couldn't need a chest, and, I, and I, somebody said, "Well, I heard in a, in a lecture by a bunch of smart men that that you know it typically go the opposite direction, so let me try that," and all of a sudden, you're like, "Well, I repeated that, and my hip function got better." Then you can put that. It helps them put you in, a, you know, the person in a category of derangement. Why would? Because they couldn't be a dysfunction. They couldn't be a, you know, an an OA pattern if it changed like that. That's the difference of articular dysfunctions. How do they present different than derangements? That's the next part of it. And probably in not just probably in extremity and spine. How would you define dysfunction versus the derangement in that example? Yeah. Well, I mean. It's it's tough because I I have such an aversion, Rob, with 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 getting pathoanatomical, and then and, and it's funny because even even with Mackenzie, you know, you go through the manuals, and at times it's just a, a really interesting juxtaposition of of in the in the manuals they'll say you know pathoanatomy doesn't matter uh, it doesn't matter, and then in the next paragraph they'll say you know. Yeah, yeah. Those functions involve remodeling tissue, you know? Um, so <laughs> it's, it's, I try to think about it more as behavior of symptoms, but even in the McKenzie textbook, you'll read about dysfunctions having to do with uh, structurally compromised uh, or impaired tissues, whether they're contractile or articular um, in, in the extremities. Uh, it's it's much more important to distinguish the behavior of a articular dysfunction versus a contractile dysfunction, um, and as as you can see on this slide, uh, the the behavior of a articular dysfunction is symptoms produced consistently and only uh, at end range, versus a contractile dysfunction. This is something that's going to be much more reminiscent of. Um, like your strains and, and tendonitis symptoms produce tendinopathies. Yeah. Yeah. Tendinopathies at the musculotendinous unit. Um, but again, you, you can simplify it further and just think about how, like, where's this pain happening? Uh, is it consistently produced? You know, these are, we can, we can kind of remove and, and simplify some of the, you know, I think I think we as clinicians have an opportunity to decomplicate um, <laughs> some of our assessment through just thinking about okay, like for, forget what my biases are telling me, the associated structures uh, that are that are involved here might be. How are symptoms responding to this? assessment and examination that I'm putting them through. Right. The interesting part, well, people, you know, it's interesting. We, I, we, we try to teach our residents about impairments. We treat impairments and, you know, I never treated the rotator cuff tear. I treated the impairments associated with it. Yeah. But, but we have to remind ourselves too, as a group, it's hard, it's hard to talk to your doctor and say they have this impairment. <laughs> you know, if I send somebody to the doc, I say, hey, doc, I think there's a, they have signs consistent with a rotator cuff tear. Well, and yeah, we know uh, you have to, you have, have the to, two languages almost, right? For sure. And you have to, uh, man, and I'm totally t sympathetic to clinicians and patients coming in yeah. uh, because you have to meet them where they are as well. And, and I think, frankly, that's where McKenzie could improve and, and at times falls short is meeting people where they are because I think it's when you remove the pathoanatomical language, I think that you almost in a way stop speaking the language that the patient is coming in with. Okay. And it, it almost, at times, I worry that, you know, when I'm talking about symptom response versus pathoanatomy with a patient, it's it's almost like you're you're losing a little credibility as a clinician. You know they don't necessarily buy in as much. Like 
this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He's talking about derangements and dysfunctions. Right. My doctor said it was a tear, which is fine. Know the language, understand who you're talking to. I agree. One of the things, so we were talking about before, understanding the difference of somebody with a derangement and just articular dysfunction. So as I was the example before, if I felt that person had hip limited range of motion, I said, hmm, that might be consistent with what I would think is some type of joint issue. But if I could do repeated motion in the opposite direction and that range of motion gets better, that can't be articular because the you know we're not having you can't get a frozen shoulder or a frozen hip whatever better with a couple of repetitions. Right. So, so those are the people. So those are where it's kind of cool where you you kind of sorry it's predictable. It helps you with predictability. If I had somebody who can get better with repeated shoulder extension, get better range, I can predict that you know it might it will get better quicker than somebody who just had some type of true dysfunction because I have to remodel dysfunctions over six right. weeks. So that's right. kind of an interesting thing to do with it. And you can and move, with, yeah, you can move forward with greater confidence as a clinician that this is really what you're treating. Like this is, if your if your repeated movements and your assessment reveal a directional preference for this patient, yeah, like this this is going to be someone who improves much more rapidly with a much less complicated treatment regimen. Um, but and if your repeated movements, like if 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 nothing. You extend their shoulder. You horizontally, horizontally adduct. You uh, you internally rotate functionally thirty times in each direction, and nothing's happening. And it's just um, not resulting in any lasting change. Then you know, move on to your next uh, part of the assessment. But you've ruled out a derangement, um, and so you've you've Thank determined you. this is somebody that's going to require remodeling. Yeah. Right. So what they've done different. So if you, you know, in the spine, I've never, they don't talk about contractile dysfunctions and, you know, what is their, what is the McKenzie Institute take on treating tendinopathies? They don't call it, I guess they call it contractile issues. Right. Is there a thought process on how you would treat that? Is it any different than everybody else's? Yeah. I mean, your, your, your treatment for a contractile dysfunction, first of all, you've determined that it's not a derangement. So you're assuming this is, uh, supposedly some tissue that needs to be remodeled over time it's not going to get better quickly um and depending on the chronicity of it and the region uh of the of the impairment um it, it's going to take probably at least six weeks um to really get better um so you really want to be confident on that provisional diagnosis um but the the treatment for a contractile dysfunction is that loading through painful range and it needs to be actually be pain this is kind of where no pain <laughs> no gain kind of comes into play actually and it's that, that's where mckenzie extremities courses have kind of reframed my thinking of uh of, of treating those contractile dysfunctions uh because you actually know that you're loading the tissue enough when you bring on about a four to a six out of 10 pain. Uh, and you know that, first of all, you can be more confident that it's a dysfunction when pain does not persist after loading. Um, pain should never last longer than 15 minutes uh, when, you're, when you're treating somebody with a contractile dysfunction or an articular dysfunction. Um, and the treatment is very simple. I mean, as with derangements and as with articular dysfunctions, uh, you give them one exercise to do, uh, and and that's that's another um, kind of beautiful part of the of the method is just give them one thing to do uh, at home. It's for a contractile dysfunction. It's uh, say I've got um, something that presents as uh, a rotator cuff tendonitis and I've got painful range. I've got that, that hallmark textbook, painful arc. You load it enough to bring on that four to six out of 10 pain through that range. You have to go through that range. And as a clinician, you can be creative with it. Uh, you can do eccentrics, you can do uh, concentrics. Or even isometrics. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Or isometrics. As long as it's through that painful range, 
that's how you're supposedly remodeling that tissue. Uh, and that's pretty simply three to three sets of 10 to 15 reps just daily. Um, so it, when, when you follow that one exercise and you track it over time, you can really be methodical and make appropriate progressions versus, you know, the spaghetti method of, uh, you know, give them five things and hope that something sticks. And so the key to their treatment of their tendinopathies is Jill Cook's it's, it's typical tendinopathy thinking, you know, they've taken probably, you know, every group takes on their researchers. There's some, uh, so Jill Cook seems to be their, you know, tendinopathy. So it's not necessarily a McKinsey. So that, that's an interesting part of it. It wasn't very McKinsey. It's just how they, what they used for the research that's already out there. Some other stuff was McKenzie like things. It was just yeah. management, the typical management. So we're talking about posture things. We're not even really going to, for this type of person, it's somebody produce only, at, if they only have, you know, pain produced at prolonged static holding, likely they them being your patient, they just gather that position and they're not going to. So we're not going to really talk about that person, but. I would love to see these in the clinic, but uh, you don't see those. Don't. Yeah, if, if they're rare, if posture syndrome syndrome is rare in uh, in the spine, it's rare, and it's even uh, it, it, most of the course directors that I've spoken to just never see a, a posture syndrome in in the extremities. And just to be complete, so the others, you know, it's like it's always the word. There's ten other things for the other. Right. Yeah. So we have the main ones and any thoughts, any just I'm not going to do a lot of this, but any yeah. comments about others? I think as far as the others go, um, these are what we've all got the kind of ubiquitous training for, right? This is, this is where we, we all just use evidence-based based practice to treat uh, trauma, uh, uh, you know, acute injuries. Um, post-op patients, you follow the guidelines, you follow the um, progression and rules for, for inflammation and healing for most of these patients. Um, but you get to other subgroups, right? You get to these subgroups and you feel confident about this classification by going through the assessment, doing your uh, history intake, listening for those um how symptoms behave for the patient, um, and then doing your physical examination, uh, including the repeated mo movements and the effect that that has on range of motion um, and on their pain and symptoms in order to feel confident that your patient is going to fall into this more general um, conservative care approach, right? Um, because you may be treating a patient that you think falls into one of these subgroups, but unless you fully explore um, your cause and effect assessment, um, you might be missing out on a derangement, somebody that could actually be uh, responding much more quickly and much more effectively just to, you know, one or two movements. Right. How do we do? We definitely want to get rid of the the spine, everybody has their way. I mean, the quick way for me for cervical, you know, I probably don't go through the whole. I kind of, honestly, for somebody who I think might have a cervical, I don't even, I just go right to side bending, over pressure, end range, end range, and then see if it changes their shoulder. You know, same type of lumbar for their hip, you know, trying to rule out that stuff. But once you kind of ruled out the spine and, you know, again, as we'll talk about, they're, they're very... You know, if it's if it's a hip lumbar, you spend a lot of time rolling it out. If it's shoulder neck, you know, I have a whole, you know, I could say as a company, if you look at photo, look at our outcomes, are the one we could do the we could do the biggest changes are our shoulder patients. Those are seem to be our lowest scores. And I always ask people, why do you think? And I have a philosophy. I have two philosophies with that. I think it's complicated joint, and I think that. There's probably more neck involvement than we think. I'm not saying every shoulder patient is a neck patient, but there's a lot of times I'll find they go together. You know, you could have, we could have a shoulder patient, we have a neck patient, and then I think what's more typical is they have a shoulder neck patient, right? You have one, two, or three. And I think 
you know, just the connections later, all those, you know, periscapial muscles or attachments, how it'll affect the neck. And it's not that, you know, it might not be a discogenic pain. It might be just a joint being in a, you know, if we're talking about this stuff, it's not its best centrated position. The joint is askew, whatever reason. And when they try to do it, they look at their arm, let's say the vader or upper something pulls on that on the cervical spine, giving you some type of aberrant motion. So I think don't, you know, don't forget about it. I've had a bunch of patients who I thought were hips that I repeated, pushed them into lumbar motions and the hip pain went away. So be aware of that, how close they are. Um, yeah. There's a nice way. Good. The opposite. The opposite can also be true. I feel like I just I, I evaluated somebody one or, a week or two ago um, with a diagnosis of you know that lumbar reticulopathy uh, and only reports of ankle pain. Um, and after really fully exploring the spine, you know these are two separate issues. She might have had a little history of back pain, but they you know, you can really feel confident about, you know, the other side of that coin, how much influence really is the neck having on this? And like you said, Rob, is this, is this a combination of the two? I think a study came that. just this past year, I think, I, you know, don't quote me on it, but something like 47% of shoulder pain uh, is at least influenced in some way by the neck once, and they, they determined that by, uh, you know, once they treated the neck, those shoulder pain improvements occurred. Um, so it's definitely not something to ignore. And that's something that I have to practice too, especially on those bus busier days. You want to take right. the re referring diagnosis at face value. So the hardest thing, and it's probably not the dis purpose of this discussion, but then we have to think of as clinicians, how do we tell the patient? That's where you can get, that's where I think, you know, young clinicians get in trouble because they say, no, it's your neck, not your shoulder, da, 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 you know? And I think it's how we talk to the patients and say, hey, you know, we're going to work on this whole area. It's going to, you know, this area affects this area. So I always worry that our, our, yes, but, you know, younger people who haven't had the opportunity to get chewed out by a physician or lose a referral because you, you second guessed, you know, for my, you know, for being the older guy in the group, I guess the, the recommendation, you find something like that that's so blatant, that's truly like a ridiculopathy in the shoulder. You know, you, you might, you can even make the call and say, Hey, look, I'm finding this, this, and this, they have tingling. When I go into this position, they're on, what do you think? I'm one not to tell a doctor the diagnosis, but I'll guide them to it. But that's a whole other biopsychosocial, but I always be careful when we go to a doctor and tell the patient, no, your, your doctor's wrong or it's this, and then yeah, the doctor sure. gets bad. So that's a whole other. Yeah. Well, and, and luckily we can justify it in so much of what we do, whether that's saying, you know, uh, you know, we want to we we want to make sure not to ignore your back because it's it's you know, uh, it's the foundation of the house, right? And uh, proximal st stability for distal mobility, right? Uh, and and our our understanding as a clinician may be, yeah, the back is influencing symptoms a lot more on this knee than than maybe but we're during diagnosis, yeah, right. So here's our question from was an hour ago, how. How many people, you know, what's the likelihood of, uh, what category would your patient typically put more patients in who OA at the knee? It's a good study, uh, interesting part. So they realized that exercise intervention, a lot of McKenzie looking at knee OA, right? And I'll let Will do the, the discuss. I thought it was a pretty cool article. Oop, that's it. That was good. <laughs> Got it, though. Yeah, so... So in this particular study, 99 patients with uh, a diagnosis of knee OA received a McKenzie exam, uh, and 40 of them fit the criteria for uh, a derangement. Uh, I don't think they were clear in the study of which direction they responded positively to, what their, what their actual directional preference was. Uh, those classified as derangements received those directional preference exercises um, and the other group received just kind of a general, uh, uh, you know, wh whatever exercises you would prescribe for knee OA, uh, evidence-based exercises. And then there was a control group that received no treatment at three months. Derangements were twice as likely to, re uh, to reach a minimally de detectable change in pain when compared to non-derangements. Um, so 
my takeaway from this study is yes, of course, um, you know, we know patients with those directional preferences, whether, whether you're from a school of thought that would refer to them as derangements or not, but we all, we all know that especially patients with that radiating pain, um, we want to explore to see if they have that directional preference. And as it turns out, uh, a good, you know, uh, nearly half of these patients fit the criteria for having that directional preference, which is awesome. But it means that we must, you know, before looking at this study or taking the McKenzie extremity courses, uh, it would be much easier for me to just look at my knee OA patient and disregard the possibility of them even having a directional preference and thinking that they could respond positively and quickly to a specific exercise. But clearly, there's a big percentage of these patients, and it doesn't need to be just knee OA. Um, it could be your older adult. You know, we know how prevalent um, uh, shoulder pain is in older adults. Explore to see if they have a directional preference because there may be an opportunity to get them feeling much better, much more rapidly than if we treat them with our older adult uh, neo a program uh, right. so that's that's the exciting thing from this study that i got from this so the cool part about the study the rest of the rosedale study said that um these are patients with oa who were referred for a total knee arthroplasty and flexion 60 percent had a directional preference for flexion so i thought that was kind of interesting oh, nice. yeah so, so what you would do again during this is you know, when you go into the clinic tomorrow and you have that patient see what hurts knee extension hurts repeat and range flexion, do it 10 times and see if extension gets better. Can't go wrong with that. You know, you can explore different, you can do, you can get more, uh, you know, you can do flexion, extension, add in rotation, but start with the basics, right? Get that, see if it changes it, repeated motion. You know, I had somebody fairly recently with meniscal path, you know, again, we know there's their findings, the x-rays show, but if we could tax somebody before, we're not saying we're not by far, we're not going to cure an OA knee per se. It's not our goal. Our goal is it's just a, we're movement science. You know, yeah. if we could progress them not to have it, and then we could go through. I know what George would ask about the whole strength, and I agree. We go up. I would do. Maybe they wouldn't. I would progress up the up our pyramid, which would be motor control, for sure. And and one quick and dirty assessment that I like to do uh, with you know ex patient with uh, with knee pain. Um, have them squat, have them do stairs. It doesn't need to be our formulaic manual muscle test or range of motion assessment either. I mean, those are great, um, but have them do what they're reporting is bothersome because what better baseline, if they can reproduce that in the office, have them squat and then have them uh, flex their knee 10 or 20 times. See how they feel squatting after that. The exciting thing is when you have some patients report a dramatic change in their pain with squatting after that, you don't need to sell them now because they know what it's going to be. And sometimes it's extension. Right. So to be clear for that knee, you know, we're talking about, it wasn't nothing to do with the spine for that Rosedale. It was all knee. It was all directional preference for flexion of the knee. So in case somebody, somebody wrote to me specifically, Hey, was it spine or knee that the directional preference was truly for the knee flexion for the knee was that. So with this, we have a few minutes for getting past it on it. Everybody's probably getting tired. It's almost holiday time, but here's a really good hour. Let's do another hour. We can do this. <laughs> what I like about the treatment principles, we have this slide and it talks about, you know, how you would, what the McKenzie or what we would do too, but what you would do for this patient. You know, if it was a derangement, be consistent with it. Every one or two hours, they got to remodel it. Over time, they have to keep it. You can't just do a couple of reps and be done, right? And kind of help to not centralize, but because we're not centralizing with this derangement. We're getting that um, to achieve their end range further, further, further. If you're in a McKenzie clinic where you kind of getting used to it over time, when you do a range of motion, we don't tend to get to end range until we, until I say in my head, you know, wrist further, and then I go further, further, further. You really get to the end range of it. Um, articular, you know, if you want to, I'll do articular and you the last couple, and then we'll, we'll get them. If they have questions, I'd love to be able to answer questions. But yeah. 
with articular, you know, we want to do again, three groups of 10. We want to remodel over six weeks. We want the pain to be, you gotta get to end range. You know, the, the, it's where the magic happens and don't be, don't forget 15 minutes. It could last up at 15 minutes after if they have pain for hours later, they went too far, probably went over four to six during it. Want to finish up the last couple and then we'll take questions. Yeah, contractile is really uh, same rules for for articular dysfunction. Um, you really want to load through that painful range, um, and oftentimes this requires some kind of load free weights uh, theraband. Um, get creative with these these folks, but you can also be very specific to what's bringing on that discomfort. You can it doesn't need to be five exercises. Um, and then with the other, that's when we're just being very case dependent, uh, follow the evidence-based practice. Um, personally, especially with chronic pain patients, try to have a, a, a strong foundation of pain science education. Um, and they, regardless of who this is within the other subgroups or what the subgroup is, trauma, post-op, uh, you follow the, um, produce no worse or increase no worse, build a tolerance to whatever activity they're trying to return to and habituate. Sorry. What is, so yeah, so we make sure we're on the same page because that sometimes we use words that people, what is, what does increase no worse mean? Increase no worse. Uh, for the non, non McKenzie people. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, you're working with someone, um, uh, so increase no worse. They're, they're already at a two. Um, you have them do an activity. Um, during the activity, they're saying, um, yeah, it's going up to a four or a five, but then five minutes after they stop the activity, it's back down to a two with produced, they're starting from a zero, right? Um, so just, you know, make sure that pain does not linger. Um, and that's, that's pretty consistent with, with how I think most of us have been taught. Right. Okay. And on the other part, so we'll do a quick and then we'll, I think we got the basics go through. Um, anything we'll talk about derangement. We didn't know what's being deranged. Key part is roll it in or roll it out. It's simple if you have it, and you can make a huge difference. If you fail, if it's not a fail, if you feel get anything, it's no big deal. Just move on to the next. Like it's not. You don't have to keep searching. I think if you find it very good, you'll make differences that some people will never, ever have the opportunity. They won't look deep enough. Repeated that motion. Uh, spine involvement. What else? Pick a, pick something else out of that, and we'll uh, ask them. Or to your oh. other one that you want to probably yeah, go to the yeah. end. I think you like that at the end. The last one's yeah, your yeah, for sure. Yeah, just just um, don't be afraid to send somebody home with one thing to try. That is going to yield um, so much information for both you and them. Um, if you're not sure if somebody has a directional preference, um, you know something that I think. I've tried to get a lot better at is just sending them away with something to try. Um, uh, especially if I'm suspicious, they might be a derangement. And if they come back and tell you, uh, that it, that it didn't change symptoms, you can at least be more confident in your diagnosis of them. Hopefully clearly gave enough information that made some sense to you guys. Um, if it might be different, it's again, it's not a, it was interesting. I don't think it's a game changer, but it gave me another tool. That's what I like about every system that we talk about, even with our groups that you know, every system has its really cool and good things that make a difference. You know, no, no one system helps everybody. So I think McKenzie has its, or that idea of thinking in Maitland had that thinking process. It's yeah. Cause I, I think, I think that as clinicians, like regardless of where your bent is, whatever your draw is, whatever, whatever you've been drawn to as a, as a system outside of school, whether that's McKenzie or Maitland or whatever, whatever helps you to organize your thoughts in a, in a, in a critical way and methodically, which McKenzie does for me, then you're going to, you're going to lose less sleep at night, worrying about what to do next with this, uh, complicated patient. You're going to, whatever makes you feel more confident in your decision-making that's evidence-based, I think. You know, for me, that's McKenzie, but find something that hones your, your reasoning. Okay. Thanks everybody. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, we really, uh, appreciate you spending the time with us. This is in the mind of Rob and Will. 
Thanks. And then now I have to say, don't forget to smash that like and subscribe button. Yeah.